So you need this series of teaching that is going on because you'll be richly blessed. It's to fortify you and arm you in Jesus' name. All right, we'll be taking our offering, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, offering and tithes, and project seed and whatever anyone is going to give this morning. Last week, because of the upgrading some banks are doing, you understand that some people were not able to give. And it's based on that that um, we have an account and we are opening more. Amen? Amen. So as you're giving just one account here, Providos Bank, take it and um, specify exactly what you're giving, tithe, offering, or project. Just specify it if you want to do a transfer, both here and online. And then if, you, if your own GT Bank is going, please also give to that. And um, we'll open more accounts so that we will not be held hostage by any bank in Jesus' name. All right, you need an envelope. The ushers will give you one if you lift up your hand. Ecclesiastics chapter 5. And please, I want you to pay attention to what I want to say. Now, listen carefully. Whatever you decide to give to God, even though you have not given it, belongs to God. Did you get that? And you can't take it back. Whatever you just thought, okay, from this morning, maybe you got 20,000 naira, and you said, okay, I'll give my tithe. I just want to sow a seed, 5,000. Don't change it. Don't decrease it. Look at what the Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'll read two scriptures for us. From verse 4 to verse um, 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, 4 to 6. When you vow a vow unto God, a vow is between you and God. It's not it's not, you may not tell anybody. It's between you, heart to heart. Say, when you vow that vow, don't delay to pay it. Don't do every other thing and look, when it's look for when it's convenient. It's an insult on God. Don't defer it, for God has no pleasure in fools. So God regards you as a fool that you vow to him and it's not important to you to redeem it. Say, don't delay to don't delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Vow is a free will decision that you made. Vow can be your offering. You can decide from this month, I will give God so so, so amount. Don't change it. Even if it's your money for food. It's not just when you vow like Anna. God hates those who change their vows. Now, verse 5. Better is it that you did not vow. I say it would have been better you didn't propose in your heart to give God anything than that you should vow and not pay it. The next one, verse 6. Suffer not your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. That's why I learned this early because when I got born again, I, I was worshipping in a church that they made people make a lot of vows. And many people didn't keep it. So that's why in this church, we have never told people to make a vow. It's between you and God. In fact, people come to me and say, God told me to give this, and I encourage them. But we won't do that from the pulpit. Because nobody told Anna to make a vow. Does it make sense? But God can also instruct you, like he told Abraham, go and give me your Isaac. And when God speaks, you will know he's God. He will tell you directly. So he says here, don't suffer your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Neither said before an angel, it was an error. I made an excuse. I made an error. I made a mistake. I didn't mean it. Don't do that. Because anything you say, God takes it. He said, wherefore should God be angry at your voice? God recorded what you said and destroyed the work of your hand. So many people have not been promoted. Many people are struggling financially or struggling in their work because what God told them to do. Are you getting what I'm saying? I'm giving you a powerful secret. What God told them to do, maybe they didn't do it or they started doing it and stopped. Then what they promised God they would do, they are no longer doing it. Or they are doing it when they like. He says when you do that, God will be angry with you. Not Satan, no. He 
will destroy the works of your hands. Look at it's specific. Destroy the works of your hands. Does it make sense? So you've learned something now. Whatever God puts in your heart, maybe you want to give now as you're typing, you say, he tell you give this amount, give it. Every act, everything God tells us to do, we do by faith. And when we do it by faith, God himself will now react. It may be that is the last money in your account and God says give it. And as you do that, as you obey him, he touches somebody else's heart to do something a hundred times more than what he's asking you to give. The same way, when we sow a seed, when we go to the farm and put a seed of corn, there is no way the ground will give us a seed of corn when it grows. Is it possible? No. If the ground God created can give us much more than the seed we sowed into it, how much more God? So why he's angry is because you don't believe him enough that he can take care of you. There are fathers here, or I mean men here, when your child doubts your ability to provide for, to, for him, or for her, is the, one of the biggest insults. Am I right? Uh -huh. The same way God sees it. So do what he asks you to do. Because it's when you do it, you will provoke him to do his own part. And when he asks you to give something, keep giving it. When God told us to increase our tithing as a church, and we did that. When we told us, in fact, we gave it an answer as if nothing will happen that month. But I can testify to you that God is good. And he, I, I was just watching a program on, online. And the man was speaking and God told me, okay, from today, you will increase your own. Increase the church own. And I, I checked it because I kept records. And I checked in the last one year. What we, gave as a, we give as a church or I gave is nothing compared to what God has done for me. The ones I can see. So when he's asking you to give because it's a law, seed time and harvest, it's because he wants to give you a bumper harvest. And I pray that you trust God enough, you have faith enough in him, that your current giving will not limit the miracles of God in your life in Jesus' name. And I'm praying for the mercy of God over anyone that is not taking giving seriously or casual, of the things God has instructed you to give or to do. May the mercy of God reach you today Amen. and turn around a new beginning for you. Amen. Receive grace to obey God fully Amen. and with joy. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Did you learn something new today? Yes. Give Jesus a big clap offering somebody. <laughs> the account details are right there. You can do your transfers. You need an envelope. God will give you. If you're online, please follow the giving details. Can you stand to your feet? The choir will lead us as we give joyfully to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh, all right. God said I should tell you this. Let me, let me tell you something. I am called of God and sent. And I have proofs. It's not just mouth. Proofs. Everything God commands me to say, he confirms it. So this morning, I'm going to bless you. Open your heart and receive the blessing. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I stand here today as your servant and sent one. I speak over your people. In blessing, bless them. Amen. In multiplying, multiply them. Amen. In promotion, promote them. Amen. What, whoever is under the sound of my voice, that has been cursed, the works of their hands have been cursed. That the works of their hands is under a satanic siege. In the name of Jesus, I command that siege to be destroyed. Amen. I command the, bless, the curses to be swallowed by the blessing of the Lord. Amen. Lord, we are giving today to honor you, to acknowledge you, and to appreciate you. Accept all our tithes. Amen. All our offerings, all our project seed, let them come as a sweet smelling sap on your nostrils and do as you have pleased in our lives. Let someone return next Sunday with testimonies. And Lord, as many you've instructed that have, that have not done what you've instructed but have now received mercy, grant them grace to be joyful and complete, completely obedient to your word. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, as many do this, turn around their situation. Amen. 
and show yourself to be the great provider that Jehovah Jireh indeed in the mighty and matchless name of the Lord Jesus have decreed and we have received. Amen. Amen. Give Jesus a big clap offering. Choir please. Put your hands together. Come on. Say, ay, ay, ay. Come, <laughs> Abasimi ya 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 o, ha ya ya o, ananando. Abasimi ya 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 o, ha ya ya o, ananando. Ha ya ya o, ha ya ya o, ha ya ya o. Put your hands together. Come up, come up, come up. Clap your hands. Sir, great and mighty God, He did give me joy to give you praise. Great and mighty God, He did give me joy to give you praise. Great and mighty God, He did give me joy to give you praise. Great and mighty God. Give me joy to give you praise. Great and mighty God, oh, he did give me joy to give you praise. Oh, great and mighty God, he did give me joy to give you praise. Say, great and mighty God, oh, he did give me joy to give you praise. Oh, great and mighty God, he did give me joy to give you praise. Just to a fire, just to a fire, just to a fire, just to a fire, just to a fire. Jesus, we praise you. 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 We praise you. Hallelujah. Please be seated in his presence and a very good morning once again. Amen. Praise, praise, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Let's go right into God's word. Let's take our confession. As I sit, please, everyone declare. Declare boldly. Amen. There is power in your words. Let's declare it boldly. One to go. As I sit under the teaching of the word of God, I declare that my heart is a prepared ground to receive the living seed of the word of God. I am focused and do not permit any form of distraction or distortion. As the word comes forth, every need in my life is met. I receive revelation knowledge. I receive light for every dark area of my life. I receive the impartation and grace of the world, oh, sorry, I receive the impartation of the spirit and grace of the world to be a doer. I pull down and destroy every stronghold and high thing in my mind that will challenge or oppose the truth of the word of God I hear. I receive and believe the word I hear today as the truth of God. This word bears fruit in my life a hundredfold. As God confirms the word, 
with miracles, wonders, and signs in my life. Amen. Father, I thank you, and uh, we stand here today to hear from you. There is a burden on your heart that is for us. I ask that you walk through me to discharge this burden and put it upon your people so that they will know exactly what you expect of every one of them, Amen. from the oldest to the youngest. Amen. Give me, Lord, a mouth and a wisdom to distill your wisdom, your insight. Give me, Lord, the tongue of the learned to speak to your people with clarity and with understanding. And for your people, open the hearts of as many who are willing and expectant. Let us not go back the same. Sow the seed of your word and let it bring forth mighty harvest of righteousness, of holiness, of wisdom. And I will glorify the Lord Jesus. We thank you because you've heard. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. Once again, we are, I'm teaching on the spiritual dimension of leadership. Leadership is spiritual. And we have the picture of leadership in the Bible. I mean, God is the creator. He created everything. So he would have created leadership if he's the creator. Because he's the creator of everything visible and invisible. All that exists. Romans chapter 13 from verse 1. We see where God is telling us about leadership, how he made it and how he made it to function. Romans 13 from verse 1, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. So he talks here of leadership. For there is no power but of God. That means there is no authority or leadership except God approves it. Nobody comes to a place of leadership without God's approval. God may not be the one to put them there, but he approved of it. Does it make sense? No power. Are you here still here with me? For there is no power but of God. The powers that be, the leaders that be, the leadership that be are ordained of God. I can't, I, there was no way I would have chosen who would be my biological father. Did you choose your own? Uh, so, and the father is a leader. So the same way also God chooses, ordains, approves leadership. And that's what anything that relates to God is spiritual because God is a spirit being. Does it make sense? Yes. Now, you must understand something again, what we thought on Wednesday, that anybody occupying a leadership position, you don't have to be a president. As long as you're leading somebody, you're in a leadership position, you are of high interest to the devil and you're his target. And he will do everything to bring you into his camp or to, for you to do his will. Why? Because Satan is a rebel or the devil is a rebel against God. He doesn't submit to the leadership of God. So he wants as many people not to submit to God's leadership. And that's the reason we have spiritual conflict. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Right. Now, when Jesus, and I want you to listen carefully, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross to redeem us, we've looked at what is redemption. The first pillar of leadership is the pillar of what? Redemption. Because if you if you're not redeemed, you can't rule, you can't lead. All of humanity, except those who are born again, are under the leadership of the devil. He's their leader. But when we get born again, what happens is that the Lord Jesus has paid the price so that we can come out from the leadership or reign or rule of the devil. To come into God's kingdom. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the, to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He translated us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. He brought us out from the reign of Satan when we got born again. And then put us into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of his dear son. 
So we are, when we get born again, we are now in the kingdom of the Son of God. I mean, you need to understand it needs to be a consciousness in your life, a working knowledge in your life. And it's not the only thing that the Lord Jesus did. Another thing he did, which is of interest in this uh, discussion, is that he made us a king. He, Jesus made us kings and priests unto God. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 and verse 5. He didn't just bring us out from the reign of darkness or the power of Satan into the kingdom of his dear son. He made us kings and priests. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. Okay, let's start from verse 5 because of our time. Revelation 1 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten from the dead. What it means here is that he is the first person who rose from the dead and didn't die again. You know, he raised a lot of people from the dead. Remember that? Yes. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but they died again. He's the only one that was raised from the dead and still alive till today. Still alive. As I'm talking now, he's hearing. As you're here now, he's seeing you. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So, the only, the first, the first one to be begotten from the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. We understand prince in terms of that the king has a prince. Am I right? And so if, we, if you hear prince, you will think that a king is higher than a prince. The Greek word here, used as prince, uh, talks of somebody who has the sole right of inheritance. So it's much more than a king. That's why it's called the prince of the kings of the earth. Now unto him that loved us, that's why he became our redemption. That's why he redeemed us, because of his love for us. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You know the way you want to wash your clothes that are dirty? So you fill the, uh, the basin or whatever you're washing with water. Am I right? All right? And then soak the clothes and put detergent. You see, his blood was that water. To wash, and the detergent and water mix together, to wash us from our sins. Does it make sense what we are teaching? Yes. Now, let's take this again so you see it in another light. From Jesus Christ, now, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6. He didn't just do that only. He made, not will make. He made us kings and priests unto God his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen so when you got born again Jesus crowned you a king before God and a priest before him not to other people not to the world but when God sees you that's why they assigned angels to everyone who got born again. Because kings have bodyguards. Does it make sense? Yes, so discipleship is to train you to start thinking and living as a king and a priest on the earth. That's the purpose of discipleship. What do kings do? They reign. They lead. Am I right? Huh? But you can't just install a king to reign and to rule. You must train that king. You remember the story of uh, David? Remember the story of David? He was anointed to be king. But he never became king until the time of his training were closed. So potentially, are you a king? Yes. But are you ready now? No. You're under training. And some people don't even realize it. They don't realize it. So they live anyhow. And then they die anyhow. That will not be your portion. Amen. In Jesus mighty name. Amen. A king is trained. To think like a king. To speak like a king. To dress like a king. I used to 
my wife and I, we used to have collections. We noticed something. All the royal families in Europe, they have a protocol, a way they dress. There's a way they look. They can't just appear anyhow in public. It's training. And God wants his people to be like that. He didn't just make us only kings unto God. But also what? Priests. Now, last Sunday, when we thought, we, I thought about the making of a leader, I was teaching about how to be a king. Because you can't be a king when you come to church, you are not a king. It's outside that you are king. When you come to church, you are taught to be a priest. Does it make sense? Did you, are you getting what I'm saying? If you, if you are born again, if you are a believer, if you don't know these two facts, that Jesus redeemed you to be a king unto God and a priest unto God, you will be highly disadvantaged in this life. You won't just know it, you must be trained along those lines. When, when you master it, that's when breakthroughs will be the order of your life. So, if you're a king, you go outside, all the things we talked about kingship, excellence, working hard, brilliance, outworking others, that's king, and that's what makes you a leader. But you see, that being a king, is based on how effective your priesthood is. Kings, being a king is what people are seeing, what you do before people, what you do outside when you leave the church now. What sustains it is what you do on the inside, your priesthood. Nobody sees your priesthood. Nobody should see your priesthood. If you go to work and have to tell people I'm a born again or I'm a pastor to do something, that means your priesthood is not working. They shouldn't see it. They should say it. Does it make sense? They will just tell you that there is something about you that we can't place. There's just something about you. That's, that's, you know that your priesthood is functioning. And your kingship, that's how you rule and where you rule, is to the extent your priesthood is functioning. So, and if you don't know how to operate as a priest, you don't know how to pray, you'll be in trouble. So, your king, to being a king is before people. Being a priest is before God. Being a king is what you do in the human and physical realm. Being a priest is what you do in the spiritual realm. Does it make sense now? And it is the spiritual realm that determines what happens in the physical realm. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. That's why you go to work, meet your boss, ask for increase, you won't get it. The one who goes to Babalawo, stands on the road, junction, and makes sacrifice, will get it. That's why your market, it will not be moving. You'll be confused because your priesthood, you don't know how to handle it. But the ones who go and ask questions, go to water to pray, they will get clarity and get what you're fighting for. Does it make sense? The spiritual realm is real. If you like, say it's not real. It doesn't matter. Just You can say gravity is not real. But go when you climb the 10-story building and jump from there. If you're alive to testify, that'll be fine. Where did I call now? I called the scripture. Hebrews 11.3. N-E-T. Because every time I call it, put it in N-E-T. New English translation. Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the worlds we are set in order at God's command. So that the visible, what we see happen on Monday morning, on Tuesday evening, on Wednesday afternoon, what you see happen this week is determined by what we don't see, the invisible. What happens in the spirit realm. Does it make sense now? So you understand what it means to be a king and a priest. That's what we are born into. If you're working, if you're doing business, only Christians don't carry their gods to work. They hide their gods. 
I used to know a place where they have a ministry to the marketplace. Powerful ministry. And at a point, they stopped praying. They said they will not pray. They, that, that platform is just a whisper now. Before all corporate Nigerian Christians know it, attending to it, but from the moment they removed that priesthood, that prayer, they became a whisper. May your own not be like that. Amen. So, the order, and I want you to understand that, the, when you're born again, you are born to be a king and a priest, and you need training. I'll give you two scriptures. This is God's intention from the time he created man. He wanted a king on earth and a priest on the earth. Why a king to rule? Why a priest to connect to him? Because he's a spirit. And when you relate to spirits, there has to be altars. Altars are the meeting point between spirituality and humanity. Are you getting what I'm teaching? And the altar is their meeting point. And anyone who supervises an altar is who we call a priest. Does it make sense now? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. And if you supervise, if this is my, if I have an altar and you don't have, and I'm supervising my altar, I'm representing whichever spirit or God on that altar that I submit to. Whichever spirit or God I submit to, I'm relating to them. Now, if you say you're a Christian, and you are only functioning as a king, and you're not functioning as a priest, if by adventure you come in contact with anyone, maybe somebody in the secret cult, that has an altar that they attend to, they will win you hands down. And you can't do anything. This is the reason many Christians are defeated, destroyed, and confused. There's something deep I want to say here. You know, when you pray, when you pray as a child of God, in the name of Jesus, and if you pray according to his will, God releases the answers to your prayer. Do you believe that? But that God released it is not a guarantee that you will receive it. Do you also believe that? If you doubt it, Daniel, the story of Daniel, he prayed. God heard. God told the angel, dispatch the answer. The angel that was coming with the answer came to where Daniel was, was living. As he was traveling, the territorial prince over that vicinity said, you are going nowhere. So Daniel was shocked and said, ah, ah, please, something is not right. I prayed, no answer. I will stay in the place of prayer. So he stayed praying, praying for 21 days. Now after 21 days with fasting, he was praying with fasting. After 20, listen carefully, after 21 days, he stopped. He believed that he had seen a note of victory. Three days after the 21 days, on the 24th day, the angel came to him in the place of prayer and told him, Daniel, you are beloved in heaven. From the first day you set your face to seek God, I was dispatched from heaven. But the prince of Persia hindered me. So the territorial demonic power where you were living, are you still here? Yes, sir. Where you were living hindered me. Has God answered your prayer? Yes. But the answer has not reached you. What made me, the angel was now explaining to him, and we understand from the book of Daniel, what made me to get to you is that you stayed in your priesthood. You kept on praying. And because, of, because you kept on praying, God sent another angel, Archangel Michael, to come and remove that obstacle. Does it make sense now? But did God answer Daniel's prayer from the first day? Huh? Did the answer get to Daniel? So how many of the answers to your prayers are hanging or diverted? Why? You didn't stay on your priesthood. A believer without a functional priesthood is a risk. 
Now, the priesthood I'm talking of is not going to people to pray for you. It's because Daniel didn't call anybody. It's just Daniel and God. Stayed on it until he saw the answer. Did you get clarity now? Do you get clarity now what I'm saying? All right. So, when we got born again, God saved, the Lord Jesus redeemed us. He was the ransom for our redemption. He redeemed us so that we can function as kings. His kings before people and priests before God. Does it make sense? Right. Now, in the, are you still here? In the, old, in the Bible, there are two kinds of priesthood. Now, remember what I've said that. Why priesthood? Because you're dealing with the spirit realm. That's why there is a priest. A priest is somebody that represents humanity in the spirit realm. That's who a priest is. And every priest must have an altar. Altar is prayer time. Devoted time. It doesn't have to be a physical place. Does it make sense? So, you, you, as a priest, you must have an altar where you will be calling on God's name. And it must be every day. And not just every day, it must be twice a day. That's the pattern God gave them in the Old Testament. That every day, every morning, the priests of the Old Testament should light up candles and burn incense. Incense there means prayer. And then in the evening, as the sun is setting, they will repeat the same thing. That as they do that, the heavens will be open over the nation. And then divine presence will flow freely. The day they stop doing it, the heavens close. Did you get what I'm saying? The same way also, when Jesus made us priests to God, kings and priests unto God, he expects us to follow the same pattern. In the morning, you call on God. And in the evening, you call on him. I said on Wednesday that that's why the Roman Catholics are very powerful. They hold mass every day. See us Pentecostals now. The Sunday you like, you come. You give excuse. They don't do it. That's why they have, you can't overthrow them. Islam, very powerful. Five times a day. On earth, there are people bowing down heads to pray. Yes, they are not praying to the God that we know. But whichever God they are praying to in the spirit realm, as they function in that priesthood, they grow powerful. Because the spiritual determines the physical. Does it make sense now? And if you start living like that, like as I've explained to you, you will find out that your life will take a new dimension. Because of time, I won't go into that, but I'll mention it briefly. No, let me not go into that. It will take us time. What does priesthood do in the New Testament? Four things the priesthood will do. You are a king. Jesus made you, when you got born again, a king and a priest unto God. You won't see the fruit of your kingship until you start functioning in your priesthood. The king is what everybody sees. The robe, the royalty, the breakthroughs, the cars. But what brings it is what? The priesthood. What you do in the secret. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he said, go to your closet, cover yourself and what? Pray. It's a functioning, let's read it, Matthew chapter 6. There are three things there he said we must do in the secret. And those are part of the functions of a priest. Are we there? Matthew chapter 6 from verse 1. Take heed that you do not do arms before men to be seen of them. And you see, now, you know, people say churches don't do anything. So churches now do something and go and show in the public. Wrong. Take this, the Lord Jesus, the owner and head of the church. This is what he said. No matter what people are saying, that's the opinion. 
Just do what God has com- the Lord has commanded. Take heed that you do not do arms before men. Take heed. Let's be careful. To be seen of them. So that people will say they are doing something. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father who is in heaven. Verse 2. Therefore, when you do your arms, don't sound the trumpets. Don't go and call camera and put it on social media. Don't do it. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. Verse 3. But when you do arms, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do you see how it works? Uh, they will say, but they will say, I'm not doing anything. Are they the ones you are reporting to? That your arms may be in secret. That's priesthood. So a priest must give arms, must give, must be a giver. And your father who sees in secret himself will reward you openly. Now, the next one, the first one is giving. A priest must be a giver. Not the one you give, everybody will know. You give to God, nobody will hear. You give to people, you announce it, put it on social media. Don't do that. Your priesthood will not function. You, if you start doing this, sowing secret seeds, you know, giving people, being quiet, you know, and doing it, people will just be wondering, ah, your own is different too. We don't understand. Just like they are wondering about me and the church. They will wonder about that concerning you. Amen. You are not shouting a loud amen. amen. You see, when you give like this, eh, nobody will be able to stop, disconnect or sabotage your source. You do it quietly, secretly, and assuming. Not that you give, you're now saying, don't you know that we are among the highest givers in this church? Don't do that. You will start diminishing from them. Or you give, you can't be corrected again. Or you give, you want to use it to control people. I paid your school fees, and so what? You didn't give in secret, so no reward. When you, as much as possible, when you give, do it discreetly, so that it's only you and God that will know. Does it make sense? That's the first one. The second functioning of the priesthood is prayer. He said, when you pray, you will not be as the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in synagogues and in the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. There are people who say, ah, this person is very spiritual. Never forget this. Every genuine priesthood is operated in secret. And where I come from, there is, um, when, they, when you grow up as a boy, they want to initiate you into the masquerade cult. It's always done in the night and in secret. I was not initiated, though. I'm just telling you. Before they say, even pastor was initiated. I was not. Oh. There's another group where I come from. They call them the Abalanze Society. The titled men. That one, my father told me that his father told him that none of his generation should ever take that title because they are initiated. When they are initiating the person inside, no other person except the initiated comes into it. They are operating a priesthood because in my, where I come from, and it should be the same for a lot of people, once somebody is titled, when they come, whether you are older or not, they will sit over you in any meeting because they are priests. Do you understand what I'm teaching? You may be 90 years, but if the guy is 60 and comes, he will stand before them. Because they are priests. And that's who Jesus made us. But to God, not to our deities in the village. And no priest can serve two gods. No priest can serve two gods. You can't. Are you still here? Please go back again. Some of us, uh, they, but they told me to bring money in the village. Uh, it's just money I'm giving. It's much more than money. You are operating a priesthood. He said, the second thing priests do, when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites for the love pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street that they will be seen of men. 
Really, I say to you, they have their reward. Some people, when you pray in your neighborhood, you disturb everybody. It's not the right way. Don't think it's not the right way. It's, it's ignorance, I tell you. Yeah, there are times you can do that, but not every time. It's not right. Verse 6. Say, but you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is, in, which is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you what? Open. This is the operation of priesthood. The one, you do it in secret, he rewards you openly. You do it openly, you get nothing. Continue, please. But when you pray, also he said, don't use vain repetitions at the hidden do, for they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. Be not like them, for your father knoweth the thing you ask for. You have need of ask for before you ask him. So what he's saying here is that when you go to, as a priest, when you go to God in prayer, what you're praying for is to find out what God wants to do in that situation. Not what you want. You are in praying prayers of inquiries to find out, God, this is what I'm facing. What do you say about it? Because priests are meant to offer incense unto God. What incense is a sweet smelling fragrance. What God wants to hear. If you pray what he doesn't want to hear, he won't hear. What does he want to hear? Find it in his word. Lord, you said in your word. He will teach you, it's not what I, I meant. This is what that thing pastor was talking. This is what it actually means. Go to this place. Does it make sense? This is the, one of the differences between the priesthood of God and other priesthood is that in other priesthood, you go and tell the deity what you want from the deity, whether good or bad. Am I right? That they will do it for you. In God's own, you go to find out what is his will. What is his say? What has he said concerning this issue? That's your job as a priest. And then he will now tell you, okay, this is what I'm saying. This is the time this will happen. Amen. Now go to verse, so that we can go to other things. Verse 16. So after here, no, no verse 16. Matthew 6, 16. Where we've stopped at verse um, 8. You find out verse 9, 10, 11, 12, so, so, so. He now taught the Lord's prayer. The order with which you pray as a priest. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first prayer point, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. Then give us this day a daily bread. Not, you don't start with give me this bread, day my daily bread. I'm talking of when you want to have a functioning priesthood. You can be there, praying, 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 functioning your priesthood. God, what do you want me to do today? I praise you, I love you, I thank you for today, thank you for your mercies. Father, this is the issue I'm facing, and he will give you classified information. I'm going to show us four ways that happens. When you come, functioning the priest, he will tell you, in five years, this is what will happen. This thing you're praying for will not happen now. That's where you receive it. And that's what will make you prophetic. He will tell you, this person you're about to sign this will, agreement with will betray you. This person that wants to marry you, they will die young go, or this will happen. Where do you get that? In the priesthood. This is the school you will go to. This is the course you should read. Don't relocate now. That's where Isaac had Genesis 26 1. Don't relocate. In the, the priesthood. That's where I heard who to marry. If everything they tell you is a surprise, your priesthood is not functioning. If everything people tell you becomes as a surprise, you don't have a functioning priesthood. What people tell you you've heard from God should be a confirmation. I've never met a genuine prophet of God that didn't tell me what God has not told me. It's just a confirmation. And you need the confirmation. Does it make sense what you're saying? Priests, they give. 
functioning priesthood, they give secretly. Number two, they pray in secret. And then number three, they fast. They fast in secret. Moreover, when, you, not if, when you give, not if you give. Number, number one, when you, when you give, not if you give. Number two, when you pray, not if you pray. And then number three, when you fast. Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. The next verse. But you, when you fast, anoint your face. Wash your face. And appear not unto men to fast, but unto the Father which is in secret. And the Father which seeth in secret will reward you openly. Did you see that? Yeah. That you're fasting and we're announcing it so that people will pity you. You have had your reward. Amen. Yeah. Now, let me show us the four things that are when we function under this priesthood, I've told us four things priests should do. Four things that when we function under the priesthood of Jesus. Now, watch something. Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament, who was the high priest, the first high priest? Anybody? The first high priest in the Old Testament. Aaron. Aaron. The first high priest. God instituted him. And under him, he had his sons as priests. His own sons. If you are not from the lineage of Aaron, you can never be priest. You can never be a priest. Does it make sense? The same way also in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is our own high priest. And only those that come from him are priests. Who are those that come from him? Those who are born again. So you see, the New Testament and Old Testament, they look, they're, 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 it's almost the same thing. Did you see that? Are you getting what I'm saying? Are you getting that? Yes, high priest in the Old Testament, Aaron. If you're not his son, if he, did, he didn't come from his loins, you cannot be a priest. Only one high priest per time. First Aaron, then his sons. He had four sons. Two of them died. And they died when they were functioning in the office of a priest, but not what Aaron has commanded. Leviticus chapter 10. Let me show you. Let me go explain this. Are you getting something from this? Yes, sir. Leviticus 10 from verse 1. Quickly, please. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, the first two sons of Aaron, took either of them, his censer, what they used to burn incense, and uh, put fire therein, and then put incense on therein, and offer strange fire before the Lord, which God did not command. Look at the result, the next verse. There went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. That's, I mean, high priest that God chose. God, killed, God himself killed them. Why? They offered what was not commanded to God. You see, many of the things of believers that are being destroyed is be as a result of offering strange fire. That's why the first thing that is important when you become a priest to God is order. You follow in the footsteps of the high priest. You follow in his footsteps. Why? God said, the only person permitted to bring fire before me is the high priest. So these two boys woke up one day and went to do what God didn't command them to do and God killed them. Verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is that the Lord speaks, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come near me and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron what? Held his peace. Because Aaron wanted to complain. God said, hmm. Is a priesthood. You must be trained. It's not what you do anyhow. There has to be order to do that. Did you get that? Yes, right. So the priesthood, the first priest in the Old Testament, Aaron, everybody who was a priest came from him. He had four sons. The first two died. The remaining two took over from them. The same way in the Old, in the New Testament, who is the high priest? The Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25.
Hebrews 7, 25. I want to get to somewhere. Let, let's, let's look at Hebrews 5. This one will take me out. Hebrews 5, verse 5. Hebrews 5, 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made what? An high priest. But God said to him, you are my son, this day I've begotten thee. That's when Jesus rose from the dead. God made him the high priest. Did you get that? And just as the same way in the Old Testament, anyone who will be a priest must come, must be given birth to by Aaron. In the New Testament, anybody who will be a priest of God must be born of Jesus, be born again. Does it make sense? All right. So what do, does our priesthood do? And you need to understand this. Let me share my personal testimony. I used to walk. And the man which I walked with had an oil field. And when I got to know him, as I got closer to him, I found out that they, he has so much spiritual packets. And strange things happen around him. But I've gone too far with him to go back. So, this teaching became handy and important for me. One of the things that happened was that we had a contract and we had an agreement, a verbal agreement. I'm sharing a personal testimony. And at the end of it, when it was time to pay me, he changed mouth. And so what did I do? Because money, why I can't compete with him with money in connection. I don't know anybody compared to him. I don't have any evidence. It was just a verbal agreement. So what do I do? You remember, I came home that day distraught. Had my bath. My wife brought food. I said, I don't want to eat. This was 2011 or 2011 or 12. I can't, no, 2011. I said, I don't want to eat. So what did I do? I went to God throughout that night because I understood priesthood. I started appealing to God in prayer. I started crying out to him all night. And then I went back the next day in the morning by himself, he came to meet me. He didn't even have his bat. I said, Nemeka, I will not cheat you. The first words. What we said, I will keep to it. I'm sorry. Now, what happened to him? What I can tell you is that as I operated at my priesthood, the God, the spirit being I served, went to his own spirit being and then went to him. And taught him a lesson that he came. Did you get what I'm saying? The mistake many of us are making is that you want something. Maybe you're walking. You're walking. First, you must walk as a king. Go. When you want something to happen, then you go to be appealing to people. Don't, not knowing that there is a spirit being, there is an altar through which they are controlled. Does it make sense? You want a contract, you go and be knocking. No, they must have seen you in the dream that you were coming before you came. If you are operating your priesthood well. In the office, as they conspire against you, they must have had a warning in the dream before they start that. That they will come tomorrow and say, please me, I'm not going. That's what your priesthood should do for you in the marketplace, in your home, in your village, and in your life. Does it make sense? You are not the one to be running away from them. They are the ones to be running from you. Did you get what I'm saying? So it's the operation of this priesthood because I'll give you four things so that we close. Number one, this priesthood, when you operate it, it connects you to the ministry of Jesus as the high priest. When you start operating in this priesthood, it connects you to Jesus Christ. Who is the high priest seated at the right hand of God? Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. So, if you 
your prayerless. You don't fast. You don't give. Nothing connects you to that. Even though you're born again. You're not operating it. Hebrews 3.1 We are for holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, our confession. Who is that? Jesus Christ. When we praise and sing, when we pray, when we give, they are incense going up to him. And he needs them to speak on our behalf. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So it's not that they're in church, they're praying, dancing, you're not doing. No, you're not giving him incense. It has nothing to work with. Hebrews 7 verse 25. Wherefore, Jesus is able also to save to the uttermost. No matter how bad, impossible or hopeless that situation is, Jesus, if you operate this priesthood, connect to him, he's able to save to the uttermost all those that come unto God by him. Seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. That's his job. But you must be bringing something to him from the earth. Not just when you are in trouble. Not just when you need something. No, you must be operating it. First Kings chapter 18. If you go home, you read it. The children of Israel forsook their altars and became slaves until Elijah called them back. So it connects us to the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Number two, when we operate this high pri this priesthood, it makes us prophetic. That means you see things before they happen. You know things before they happen. Not just spiritually, in every in business, every area of your life. You should see things. God should show you things before they happen. It makes you prophetic. You have a, it's like when you're pretty, it's like you're standing on a mountain and you're foreseeing things. Number three, you discover the purpose of God for your life when you're operating this priesthood. Some people don't know God's purposes for their life. Anything, you just want to make it. How do you want to make it? You don't know. No. You, you, are, you are redeemed for a purpose. You don't invent it. You discover it. The purposes of God are discovered. And they are discovered as you are operating your ministry of priesthood. It was in operating my ministry of priesthood that I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I'm called to full-time ministry, not part-time. It's operating it that I know, I knew how to start the church. Knew the location, exact location. is in the previous place. Knew where to live. Where we are living now, before we moved there. I, three years before then, I saw it. I, I went there, I spoke to the place. There are places you need to go to ahead and speak to before you get there. Your words must travel before you. But you must have seen. Does it make sense what you are thinking? Makes you discover what is God's specific will for your life. So that you don't just, have, just be strolling along life. You discover it. The purposes of God for our lives are discovered. They are not invented. It's not your passion. It's a, it's a revelation. It's a discovery you will make. And then the last one. Makes you know what is God's will. God's specific and exact will for your own life or for the things you're involved in. So that you're not confused. You're not running around people. There are people that have come with prophecies. They say, God said this. I say, it's God. I, just, I just tell them God did not say because I've heard it. You know, I'm a pastor. So anybody can come and tell you um, uh, uh, a prophet will come and prophesy. No, no, in the New Testament, nobody should, if you're keeping your priesthood, nobody will say something that you don't have an idea or God has not said to you before. Does it make sense now? Did you get anything from today? May the grace to operate the priesthood 
given to you by the ransom of redemption come afresh upon you. Amen. Every form of tiredness, every form of distraction, may it come to an end today. Amen. Please stand to your feet. Father, thank you for hearing your word. Can you pray that prayer? I receive it with meekness. In the name of Jesus. I receive your word with meekness, O oh God. If you receive clarity or God showed you something you didn't know before, can you thank him for it? And say, Father, I thank you for this. I thank you for that. I receive that word with meekness. Everyone pray. You don't know who to marry. The next step of your life, your business will take, is in priesthood. And God has brought that revelation. You don't wait for any pastor, any prophet. You don't need any special prayer. All you need is to have a consistent priesthood. Can you thank God for what you have heard? Now begin to receive grace. Say, Father, I receive grace to operate my priesthood effectively in the name of Jesus. Pray that prayer for yourself. Lord, I receive grace to operate my priesthood effectively. Every altar broken down, every altar of my life broken down, the altar of prayer, we are forsaking it. I receive grace to repair. I receive grace to operate in the name of Jesus. Please pray for yourself. He giveth more grace to the humble. If you ask him, he will give. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we are still praying. Every priest has garments. They are God's specification. God told Moses, Exodus 28 from verse 1, that a garment should be made for Aaron the high priest. Exodus 28, 1, 2, 3, and he specified it. When Jesus rose from the dead, he also gave us garments. And every, high pri every priest or high priest whose garment is soiled cannot function. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. And we are going to pray so that the blood of Jesus will wash away whatever that has defiled the garment of priesthood. In Jesus mighty name. Amen. Zechariah 3 verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan at his right hand to resist him. To oppose him. He was off, this Joshua, the high priest, was offering up something. But Satan was at his right hand. That means rightfully at the place. Satan had a strong accusation against him. And the purpose was to resist him. Now, verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked out of fire? Verse 3. This is the reason. Joshua was clothed with what? Filthy garments. That's why Satan was there. I want you to ask the Lord. Everywhere my garment has been defiled. Let the blood of Jesus wash and cleanse me. In the name of Jesus Christ. Pray for yourself. Everywhere my garment of priesthood has been defiled. Please pray this prayer. Let the blood of Jesus wash and cleanse me let the blood of Jesus wash and cleanse me let the blood of Jesus
Let the blood of Jesus wash and cleanse me. Abania de Zekele boy. Please pray for yourself. Let the blood of Jesus wash. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse me. In Jesus' mighty name, we are still praying. I'll close with this. Did you know how Aaron died? Aaron the high priest. Did you know how he died? Huh? They removed the... Once they removed the robe, he was dead. His life was tied to that garment. As they were removing it, strength was leaving him. You're going to pray. Whatever that wants to remove the robe of my priesthood. Because, listen, no, listen carefully. I need you to understand. They can't get you as long as that rope is on you. They can't. It's the rope of righteousness. People, Christians die. Two reasons Christians die. Either that rope was defiled, because any part is defiled, opens up, so they can attack you. Or the rope was removed. That's the only reason Christians die. As Aaron, when God wanted to kill Aaron, he told Moses to take him to the mountain, remove his clothes, and put it on his son. As they were removing it, strength was leaving him. Just like Samson, when they cut his hair. As they cut his hair, the power, God left him. You're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, any power that wants to remove my rope of righteousness, blood destroy, can you begin to pray? Re katala. Better pray this prayer with all of your hearts. Any attempt, any plan, any power, any agent of the devil that wants to remove my rope of righteousness. Lord, destroy, Lord, smite, Lord, uproot. I will not die before my time. My robe of righteousness will not be stained. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and received. Amen. Have you been blessed this morning? Can we appreciate the Lord Jesus with a mighty clap of him? All eyes closed, please, all heads bowed. Anyone under the sound of my voice, you are not born again. Or you were born again, but you backslided. Or you have been tormented by an addiction. This morning, God is setting you free. Amen. Physically here and on online. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Say this prayer after me, Lord Jesus. Anyone who wants to be born again, rededicate their lives, or is under any form of torment of addiction. Say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died for my sins. You were buried. And on the third day, God raised you from the dead that I may be made right with him. Today, I confess Jesus Christ as Lord. I believe he died for my sins. And I thank you for receiving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. We'll continue in the second service, which will start in the next five minutes. We'll come, I will teach on Wednesday, 6 p.m., how to operate the terms of operating the priesthood. So make sure you join in Wednesday, 6 p.m. It will be online on our YouTube channel or through our website in Jesus' name. Amen. This will be the best of weeks Amen. for you and your household Amen. in the name of Jesus you will hear good news. Yeah. All around good news. Yeah. In Jesus mighty name. Yeah. In this new week, the Lord bless you and keep you. Yeah. The Lord make his face to shine upon you yeah. and be gracious unto you. Yeah. Lord lift up his countenance upon you yeah. and give you his peace. Yeah. In Jesus mighty name. Yeah. Amen. God bless you.